for using my children. That would be befriend. And then lastly, fight is usually pretty straightforward. It's like an act of violence to preserve your life. These are the testimony de demographics I watched. As I said, I collected a lot of data, but like even though I only watched 22 testimonies from the Rwanda genocide, because of the nature of the testimonies, there are a lot of stressors in an individual testimony. Testimonies could also last like between three to five hours, so there's a lot of different indexing terms to go through to like make sure I don't miss anything. Um, so these were like the total numbers I watched. Because I didn't watch that many Holocaust uh, testimonies, I ultimately like eliminated them from the final analysis of the data. So these are the results of the um, of my study. Essentially, what I did is I went through that uh, spreadsheet I showed you guys briefly, and I coded them all in ones and zeros, and I put them into like a statistical analysis program to get these numbers. So overall, like I had 151 data points, so 151 incidents of stressors that I transcribed and then assigned a stress response to. I found that overall, like a belief that an individual would die or a belief that their family members would die was the highest out of all of the data. For the Rwandan genocide, the belief that you individually would die was highest. For the Armenian genocide, like losing your family and being forcibly deported was highest. This makes sense in the historical context because many of the men in the uh, Armenian genocide were taken away before the forced marches began, and forced marches were like uh, characterized by deportation. And then lastly, uh, witnessing the murder of a family member, that was pretty common, especially in the Polish ghettos where people were constantly dying or being shot by the Gestapo. So this is the result of my original hypothesis. I did find that like for men, they obviously had like a higher flight response than women. Women had a higher time response. Uh, interestingly enough, for the Rwandan genocide, women had a really high death acceptance response when compared to like all the other responses. Um, so those were the ultimate results just for Rwanda and Armenia. I didn't want to use Holocaust because I didn't feel like I had enough data. I think in interpreting those responses, it's important to keep in mind that the testimonies are not hard data. For every testimony that had a clear-cut stress type and stress response, there was a testimony that didn't because you can't alter people's reactions to stressors they face and you also can't alter people's stories. So ultimately, I was making a judgment call on what I believe their response type to be and what I believe the stressor was. And this wasn't always a judgment type that I was confident in making, but I have to do it for the sake of quality of data. But I think that is one of the problems with doing that kind of research with these testimonies. Second, cultural context is extremely important. While I, my results do match up with like current literature, it is important to note that like for, for example, the Rwandan genocide, men often like had to fight because they were separated from their families and they were directly opposed to people with weapons. Um, in the Armenian genocide especially, there was resistance um, armies. There were like pockets of resistance that men were able to do. In addition, in the Armenian genocide, women were often separated from the men, and the majority of people in the forced marches were women. This would mean that women would have overall higher responses of tend and befriend, just by the nature of being with their families and with their children, they were like put with them. As far as the death acceptance response goes, what I think happens what, what I think the explanation for that uh, response is, is looking specifically at the Rwanda genocide and the cultural context surrounding it. Sexual violence is a big characteristic of the Rwanda genocide. Some of the Hutu propaganda that directly led to the genocide of the Tutsi focused on the sexuality of Tutsi women. There is many things that have to do with the sexuality of Tutsi women that were used directly against them. And uh, it, there's no specific numbers, but a large majority of women in the Rwanda genocide experience some type of sexual violence. I think that sexual violence definitely contributes to this response of death acceptance. So this response where you completely accept death to the point where you don't want to necessarily live um, and you don't necessarily do anything to preserve your life either. Because I think sexual violence is such a traumatic experience that it gives people almost no other option and no other response type. Um, just some further examples of what I mean by death acceptance. This is a term that I struggled with, but I felt was very clear in the testimonies because it was definitely characterized by a lack of fear of death. I think everybody in this room at some point has to grapple with the fact that we are not immortal and that we will die, but everybody in this room also fears death to a certain extent. The testimonies, interestingly enough, their response was characterized by a complete lack of fear of death. You can see in like the first um, 
in the Armenian Genocide, this woman wanted to throw herself in the water and she says, I was not afraid of death. Uh, Theoneste Karanezi, she says like, um, if you die, you wouldn't have wasted your time. I asked, what should we do now? She said, nothing, let us die in peace, sit down and pray. This is this person's mother. So at the point where you were a mother and you were telling your child to sit down and pray with you so you can die together, what kind of response is that? That's something that I'm not exactly sure. Lastly, like she says, the last quote, um, some people were scared, but I wasn't scared because I was ready to die and I was willing to die. So this is a very like active and willing acceptance of death and it's definitely characterized by a lack of fear. So lastly, like some questions that I had after this was especially dealing with death acceptance, I think that people will always have an active response to something that threatens their life, whether it's 10, befriend, uh, fight or flight. I also think that death acceptance is an active response because you are actively choosing not to be afraid of death and you are actively accepting the fact that you may die. But I do think that in order to encourage resistance against genocide, especially in communities that may not have outside help, you need to avoid death acceptance. I don't necessarily think that fear of death is a bad thing. I think that the community should be able to, should be focusing on how to create communities, how to like foster hope, how to bring in aid workers to foster hope so people don't reach this point where they feel like there's nothing left, where they feel like they have no hope, and where they feel like they need to accept death. I also think this has a lot of implications for PTSD treatment because if you are a woman who has reached a point where you are completely ready and willing to die and willing to die with your children, what does that mean after you survive? How can you find another reason to live? Because if you've already accepted that death is inevitable, you need another reason to live. And I think this is important to consider, especially with the victims. Lastly, I want to briefly mention the psychological impact of trying to do qualitative research with testimonies. I watched about 57 testimonies in a period of three weeks. This did have a definite psychological impact on me. And it wasn't something that I was initially aware of, but I became aware of it after like the second week. I think that this type of research is extremely important, and I think that the work that everybody does at the Shoah Foundation is unbelievably important. But I also do think it's really important to focus on how your own mental health plays a role in what you're listening to, and how you are processing the information, and not necessarily like putting yourself in the shoes of the victim, but understanding and em understanding and appreciating the victim's story and their willingness to share it with you. So that was something that I definitely learned from this experience. Um, and then a special thanks to everybody at the foundation, Crispin and Stephen Smith and Harry, and also Cal and my roommate for keeping me sane for three weeks while I watched it at this place. No problem. <laughs> Thanks for watching. We have about um, six minutes for questions for Nisha. Who would like to begin? <laughs> Well, you guys are ready? Well, I, I can ask my question. So, uh, have you considered using forced marches experience in the Holocaust uh, testimony collection? Mm -hmm. uh, since you have chosen that experience for the Rwandan experience analysis. Mm -hmm. um, I have considered using the forced marches experience in the Holocaust. I actually like didn't have time to go through the Holocaust testimonies because the Rwandan ones took me so long. But I think if I was to like potentially expand the research project, that would be an additional layer of analysis to add. Because I do think cross-cultural comparison between genocides is important and it's something that the Shoah Foundation definitely facilitates. Yeah. yeah. I wonder if there are any other stress responses that maybe stood out to you but you decided not to make them part of your research. Mm -hmm. The the thing about death acceptance is that it's it I created it as an umbrella term for several different responses that I didn't fully understand. There was instances where like women would abandon their babies, or women would abandon their children, or women would kill their children. And I don't necessarily know if that's death acceptance. I'm not exactly sure what that is. And it is a characteristic that happens throughout all three genocides, the Holocaust, the Armenian genocide, and the Rwanda genocide. I don't know if that's death acceptance, and I don't know what it means when a mother gets to the point where she feels like she needs to either abandon or kill her child. And that was something that I couldn't necessarily characterize accurately, so I did leave that out. Yeah. Any other questions? Yeah. Um, you said this had an effect on you. Um, 
I'm just curious what kind of effect did it have? I think uh, for the second week, like I definitely had trouble sleeping and I had some nightmares and I also had trouble after like leaving the foundation after like I would get there at eight and I would watch testimonies till about four and then I would leave and it was hard for me to separate what I had just heard at work from what I was doing in my daily life and I would find that I would be having conversations with friends or people and I would get like flashbacks of things that people had said in the testimonies that I didn't necessarily want to be thinking about but I regardless found myself thinking about it anyway. Yeah. Okay, sorry, go ahead. Yeah, I just wanted to follow up. I mean, this is very important. We could just uh, starting to discuss, actually, to uh, address this point, uh, how, uh, what happens to people who are exposed to the testimonies, like you know, for research, but also students who deal with this, who watch testimonies in university classes, and also, let's say, scholars who do this on a frequent basis. So uh, uh, I think that's what you wish that uh, there would have been kind of a better introduction to you, or what, uh, was it more that you wish you would have a kind of an after briefing, mm -hmm. after, what, or both, what, what is your? I think I talked briefly uh, to Beth Marowitz and Karen Junglet, who are here, but are my bosses at the collections department about this, but I think it would have been useful before I started to understand how to go about thinking about the testimonies while I was watching them. Um, I think that it is detrimental if you watch the testimonies and you think about yourself being in that person's shoes and like experiencing what they did, especially with the Rwandan genocide, there are some like extremely graphic testimonies. And so that's what I struggled with. I learned about the Holocaust and genocide through outside reading and schoolwork. But when I arrived at the Shoah Foundation, I just immediately started watching testimony. I don't think I had a great idea as to like what exactly I was going to be seeing. And I don't think that what I saw met the expectation I had. Because it's much different reading about someone's experience in a book than watching someone viscerally recall something completely horrible, like the most evil thing you could ever imagine happened to them on video. So, yes. Thank you. Okay, thanks, Misha. Okay, next we're going to have a presentation by Aaron Mizrahi, who was one of our graduate summer research fellows. Um, Aaron is a PhD candidate in the media and culture track of the Department of Comparative Studies in Literature and Culture at USC. She earned her Master's in Media, Culture, and Communication at NYU and her BA in the History of Art and Visual Culture from the University of California, Santa Cruz. Please welcome Aaron. silence 
Um, so my project is largely on the impossibility and necessity of testimony in cases of extreme trauma, focusing largely on sexual assault and genocide, although mostly on the Shoah. My project is in two parts, looking both at archive testimony and looking at art and literature as alternate spaces for testimony and witness. And I'm interested in the task of witnessing in these different contexts. When I began my fellowship, I was initially looking for literal moments of silence in survivors' testimony. I found this to be far too limiting, as almost every testimony contained its own complex web of silences. In my research, I watched testimony after testimony that spoke to the very edges of language, the limits of words to express what they had experienced, and the deep impossibility to say an even deeper need to understand. I discovered a network of silence embedded and woven throughout the archive. Bearing witness to these silences is also a larger call for accountability. So through my research, I have discovered different categories of silence, which range from literal moments of silence to a more symbolic story of silence. Um, searching for silence in the archive was not easy. Um, and I had a lot of help about how to, uh, how to approach this from everyone at the center. Um, so a huge thanks for that, because it was almost like I wasn't sure where to start. Um, I began my research with the index um, and all of the possible terms that could lead me to silence. And actually, um, a lot of the same terms that Nisha was looking at, I was looking at sexual assault. I started with emotions, looking at uh, kind of emotional responses and reactions, um, and then more kind of like extreme stress uh, situations, a loved one's faith, um, brutal treatment. Um, because, um, uh, because it is nearly impossible to create an index term for silence. And I say that not because it can't be done, but because it raises a set of like, near impossible questions, I think, um, from like, what counts as silence, how long, must, um, how long must it be to count? Because there's so many just very short pauses, so how do you decide um, what should count? Um, what about body language and so on? And because another way to frame the question is in an archive of testimony of genocide survivors, where is there not silence? It permeates everything. So I have, um, there were so many categories of silence, but these were like the most common ones I found that cropped up in a lot of the testimonies. Um, and then a lot of testimonies actually contained all of these within them. Uh, so the first is moments of silence, these like very literal pauses and hesitations throughout the testimony. Uh, silence as a means of survival. Um, I marked many testimonies that talked about um, staying still or very quiet or not speaking as a survival mechanism. Omissions in testimony, um, often because uh, the survivor will say there isn't enough time to tell you everything, so I'm just going to tell you a little bit. Um, or things that were intentionally left out. Um, some survivors mentioned names. Um, of uh, other people that were in uh, the ghettos or camps that they didn't want included in the archive. So they actually mentioned in the testimony that they would say it off camera. Uh, the reluctance to speak. Uh, a lot of survivors talked about how they didn't share their stories for decades. Um, and this was also true for many of the liberators and that was something that I didn't um, actually know until I spent some time in the archive. And I also want to add, um, near the end of my research I was looking at uh, translators, like courtroom translators, and a lot of them talked about how they, there were things they didn't want to say, that they didn't want to repeat in the courtroom, and that wasn't something I'd initially considered to, to look for in my research, so that was something that I kind of stumbled upon, the silence that carried into the courtroom. Uh, the impossibility of speaking, so these are things that can't be put into words and can't be communicated. And then the silence of others, which is really kind of what my dissertation project is somehow trying to address through all of this. Um, the silence of the bystanders, the silence of the world after the war, uh, never asking questions, or even um, in a more kind of like personal space of families that were afraid to ask questions of their parents or their grandparents. Um, so that's something that's talked about in a lot of these testimonies that I thought was very powerful. Right. Um, and I'm just have, I had so many quotes, but I, I just chose two from this one category, impossibility of speaking, which I had, um, I think, the most notes for, for this category. 
Um, the first is from survivor Sarah Paul. So to whom do you tell it? It's not in the history books what I've seen. And the second, survivor Stella Levy, who I have a, a clip from that we're gonna watch, says Auschwitz-Birkenau is a place that is surreal. It doesn't matter who describes it, who makes movies about it, it's impossible to describe. Because what can I say? There are no words to describe the world that is Auschwitz. Um, and I thought these were very powerful too because this, my project is this like comparative, it's through comparative literature, so I'm looking at testimony, um, art, and literature. Um, and this is, especially Stella Levy's quote, is something that's kind of echoed in a lot of the literature, the poetry, the fiction, memoirs that are written about uh, the Shoah. So I thought that was kind of interesting that we put the fiction and the testimony um, kind of in conversation with each other. <coughs> have a clip. Um, so I just want to show a couple of clips. I have two um, that have these two of the categories of silence. The first we'll see a, a kind of moment of silence and the second clip is a discussion of uh, the silence of others. silences between a question and an answer and um, she talks about how um, how they didn't react so this is also like the silence as survival they didn't react because what she says is they didn't want to let the war in they thought that if they cried or they talked about it or they said something or tried to mourn their parents they would absorb the horror so she says basically that they stayed like kind of very detached and quiet, didn't say a word, and waited until they were liberated to then kind of cry and feel and speak about their parents and kind of let all of that in. Um, but they just felt that they would not survive if they reacted. Um, so that's Stella Levy. And then um, the next is Anita Lasker Walfish. Um, who has this very eloquent um, response when the interviewer asked if she talked about anything after the war. Um, I wish I had copied the longer quote, but um, in the center of the quote she says, we fell into a hole of silence and I'm not the only one who will tell you that. And she says that afterwards she and her sister really wanted to talk about their experience and they were sure that everyone was gonna ask them about what they had seen um, and what it was like. And she said nobody asked a single question, and they were so shocked that nobody had a question for them. Nobody wanted to talk about it. Nobody wanted to address it. That's when she says they were ready to speak, and then fell into this hole of silence when they realized that there was there was no willing witness. There was nobody that wanted to listen. Um, and it's a it's a very uh, long, powerful quote where she really kind of um, goes through what that feels like. Um, and then says that she's not the only one who will tell you that, that this was a very kind of common experience. And I'm sorry, I don't have the, the clips. Um, and so this, um, this takes me to this kind of notion that I'm working through in, uh, in my project that's taken from uh, psychoanalyst, painter, and uh, theorist Raha L. Edinger. 
um, who actually does a lot of work in painting on uh, kind of recovery of memory, um, especially in the Shoah and her own kind of family experience. Um, and for Bracha Edinger, this concept where she just puts an H in the middle of witnessing, witnessing um, emphasizes compassion and sharing the weight of survivor's trauma. The passive viewer becomes an active witness. And so what I'm looking at is, um, in my project is how this happens not only in archival testimony, but how it might also happen in art and literature. Um, so, um, so, but this also connects to, um, it's kind of like a follow-up on a little bit of what Nisha was talking about. Um, I had heard the term testimony fatigue um, be used when I was kind of describing my experience kind of watching this testimony as so just feeling this like complete exhaustion afterwards. Um, and several people that had mentioned this, this term that I had never heard before. And I think it speaks very much to this concept of witnessing because the, the fatigue really comes from being actively involved in sharing this kind of experience and trauma and testimony instead of being like a detached kind of witness. Um, so that's a, a kind of a theory that I'm sort of like looking through and trying to see when that shows up. Um, I also want to note it was interesting to see how often the interviewers allowed silence to happen in the testimonies and how often they were kind of cut short or they tried to fill it in um, or redirect um, the testimony somewhere else. Um, in cases where the interviewers didn't in interrupt the silence, as with uh, Stella Levy, um, it allowed for the retrieval of further memory, which might not have happened. Um, you know, these moments could have been archived if they had tried to kind of fill in the silence. Um, so there were some cases I did find where the survivors seemed to be in tremendous pain, um, where like the past is not so much the past and they're sort of reliving this experience. And in these cases, the interviewer really tried to intervene, kept trying to fill the silence and pull the survivor back to the present. Um, so I found, I'll just note, I'm running out of I'll just note that most of those happened in cases of uh, survivors of sexual abuse, especially uh, child abuse. Uh, almost, actually almost all of them, I found uh, that was the case. All right, so I'll just add, kind of, what does this look like, kind of um, putting this all together for a, a project in comparative literature? You know, what are some of the art and literature that I'm looking at? So I thought I would just kind of show you some of these um, pieces that I'm going to be working with, so you can see how I'm kind of treating testimony across. Um, the first is Edmund Jabez, The Book of Questions, written in 1976. This book was a, a response trying to figure out how to, how to witness at a distance. So he had read about the Shoah, he was living in Cairo at the time, a Jewish writer, and um, he wrote this book of questions, trying to see how literature can kind of hold the space of testimony and witness. And for Jabez, the white, um, which kind of consumes all of the pages, is the testimony <coughs> of those who did not survive. So this was his way of trying to find an archive, um, or place an archive for uh, those who can't give testimony. Uh, the next is Rachel White Reads an English Library. It's a Holocaust Memorial in Vienna. Um, and this is, her memorial is really like a, a silent witness or this silent archive that we have no access to, um, but it can only kind of see. Um, and it's this like very stark visualization, I think, of, of silence and uh, the testimony that is lost. Um, so, and then um, to look at, because my project is really kind of looking at this trauma through genocide and also sexual assault. Um, I want to show a couple of the um, a couple of the artists that I'm looking at that are working on uh, gender violence and sexual violence. So the first is Anna Mendieta. This is her untitled Silhouette series, um, which is kind of the bridge between these these two projects. And in, in this, her like central figure is this disappeared woman or a disappeared female figure, and it's this idea of um, intervening before it's too late, of silence as a kind of call to action. Um, so these, and I have one more. This one 
many of you may recognize this is the most recent work that I'm, I'm using. And Ms. Holkowitz's The Mattress Performance Carry That Weight, um, which is both testimony and art. So she's, her um, performance is a, also a testimony to her own survival of sexual assault um, and a kind of refusal to forget. It's a completely silent performance. Um, and it also has a kind of communal aspect. It has this witnessing where you can literally kind of share the weight of the burden of the survivor by helping her carry her mattress. So I hope this kind of yes. some sense of what I'm planning on doing with, uh, with all of this research. Thank you. There, there is uh, currently a project at the Wagelonian University in Krakow that aims to retranslate Lanzmann uh, uh, Shoa, the, uh, the responses of the Polish villagers that we see in that film. Uh, not so much to, say, exonerate them, but to really showcase some of the fatigue that you've mentioned in your presentation that perhaps was, uh, had affected the translator, the woman who translated it. Uh, 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 their responses for Lanzmann. So I came to uh, the Shua Foundation with a proposal to write a sequence of poems um, um, after watching and listening to testimonies. And on the first day, I, I was overwhelmed, uh, not just by the experiences I heard and saw, uh, but also by the sheer number of the testimonies that we have here on campus. And so I decided to shift gears and concentrate on testimonies that had something to do with the city of Krakow, which is where I was born and raised. And, and that also wasn't enough. There was still just way too many testimonies to watch that, uh, that named the city. So I concentrated on villages um, uh, adjacent to the city of Krakow. 
many of which are now part of the city because Krakow has grown and incorporated the surrounding villages into the city, city limits. And um, in many instances, these are places that I um, grew up in or around, playing soccer, going swimming, going for walks, going to school, etc. And I wanted to um, give a, a, a different, a new type of testimony. I wanted to refashion the narratives, the experiences of the survivors uh, as poetry. And so I have written a, a sequence of poems, 30 pages long. It's called From the Annals of Krakow. And I'm going to read a few excerpts from the work to you today. One thing that you should know before I proceed is that there are three narrative threads that run through the sequence. There is the character of uh, Piotr. Uh, it could be uh, myself, Piotr doing the research here on campus. Then there is a fellow named Piotr Polin, which as probably you know, Polin means Polin in Hebrew. And he is a guide on the ground in Krakow uh, showing um, uh, uh, places in Krakow associated with uh, with Holocaust um, and uh, uh, formerly Jewish places in the city and then of course there are the testimonies themselves and so throughout the sequence which is very polyphonic in nature I weave these narratives of the researcher the guy on the ground in Poland and also of course the actual uh, testimonies and the experiences of the survivors themselves uh, one other word uh, uh, before I begin. What, what initially inspired me to pursue this project was a book of poems by Charles Reznikoff, the American poet who um, had transcribed the Nuremberg trials into poetry and published a book called Holocaust. And I mentioned that, that very work in this, in this first poem. The American poet Charles Reznikoff copied out fragments of the Nuremberg trials transcripts to create his powerful Holocaust, a book of singular vision and horror. The tone and delivery, both flat, sneak up on you. The who, what, and when gets answered at the expense of the why, which too often gets answered with questions anyway. For my part, I've watched the testimonies for inspiration. Is that an evil thing, to be inspired at the same time as horrified? The tug of war didn't end when I closed out the browser, logged off, and took off the headphones. Back home, I delved into an album of Holocaust paintings by Wilhelm Sasna, poring over his 2003 Shoah forest piece. The primordial wood in heavy, deliberate brushstrokes towers over three tiny figures. The greenery a dust storm, not foliage. Taking unhurried steps, the survivor is talking to Lanzmann through a translator. Beyond the frame, off to the left, the villagers are talking directly to me. One of the first testimonies I watched at the Shoah Foundation belongs to Clara, her black dyed hair and beaming smile. What does she see while spelling the town's name with her eyes shut? Each letter, a face, a house, a meal, a tree, a bend in the road, an end that she and her brother and parents had once shared the southern Polish city with Piotr's grandparents is a fact. Whose if not mine are these words? Listening is a form of speaking viewed from another angle, the far corner of the room where the servers hum with the stories of survival. The room I worked in has become a story itself. 
the keyboard, the mouse, the screen in front of me. For every search word, either a place or name, an index of offshoots and tributaries. Krakow kept showing up on every map. The surrounding villages, Skawa, Grembaów, Mogiwa, or Weng, whose names mean something else to me, no less a constellation of what could have been if the day of the week were a Monday instead of a Wednesday, morning instead of evening. These words become mine the moment I let them go. I don't know if you can see this uh, from far away, but this is the old town of, of Krakow, the place where millions of tourists um, come to see. This is the former Jewish quarter of the city right here. And I was born near the old town, but I grew up in the district called Nova Huta, which is to the east of the city, as you can see. It's a place that was built as a separate town by communists in 1949 in order to house the workers uh, to be employed at the newly built steel mill. Uh, and the places I just mentioned, Skawa, that's, you can see an arrow right here, that's just to the north of the city. Mogiwa, it's right here. Wang, it's this area right here. And Chijine, which I will also mention in one of the poems, is right there. <clears throat> so here's about the guy, Piotr Polen. Piotr Poland was born in the 70s, in May. He told me as much as we crossed the intersection of Dietla and Starowiczna streets. He shares a birthday with the late John Paul II. Nobody in Poland forgets his birthday. A history major, he leaves no stone unturned. Wieliczka, Płaszów, Prokocim. Before he knew anything about the Jews, he went to summer camps on trains departing from Płaszów. When he broke both arms, having fallen off the window of an abandoned house whose walls were covered with the sweetest grapes, he ended up at the children's hospital in Prokochim. The doctors were nice to him. The beds and equipment bought with dollars. Years later, he says, when he mentioned to one American Jew that he'd been to the museum of Auschwitz numerous times, the man asked him, did you enjoy it that much? Those are the facts. From Starovishna, we turn right onto Miodova, Honey Street, then left on Sharoka. The Jewish festival had ended yesterday. He asks if I'm hungry. Once upon a time, an SS man took me away. He needed a translator. I spoke Polish and German. He took me to a farm, gave me a knife, and made me catch and kill a chicken for him. Afterwards, he took me back to my parents, thanking me for helping him out with his hunting affair. When is the wheat high enough to hide in? Parting wheat en route to freedom might attract suspicion. No wind can part the wheat the way a person in hiding can. The light of day troubled me. The light, the why I was found out in a barn. Here, child, put on this hat. Its white brim will protect you. We, the uncircumcised, will take you in. Piotr remembers 
the day when Steven Spielberg's people came to his school looking for dark-haired children to star as extras in Schindler's List. While at the Shoah, I did a lot of Googling. That's how I found out that Eamon Good's house in Poishuf, the one with the infamous balcony, still stands. And allow me to close with this poem that takes us into uh, Nova Huta, Chijene in particular. Uh, I mentioned uh, Chijene in this poem because of these two lines right here. I'm not sure if you can hear, see them from back there. Uh, but these two lines denote the former airfield uh, that I heard about time and again in the testimonies. Many of the survivors heard worked on Aryan papers uh, on the construction of this airfield. Um, it exists to, the, to this day. It's no longer an airfield, um, but the runway is still there. After touring Kajimish, Piotr said we should go to Nova Huta, east of the city center. When it was built in the late 40s, it gobbled up surrounding villages, including Chizhine. Today, the location of an excellent airplane museum in a park dedicated to Polish airmen who fought in World War II, first in Poland, then with the RAF in Britain. Piotr says he's never been to the museum, preferring unmediated historical touring. He wants to see and touch and feel things without glancing up on little clocks explaining things. Oral history, too, is his name. When we arrive, having taken Line 1 tram from the Old Town to the sports and concert arena, we head north across the park, skirting the Academy of Physical Education. But rather than the park itself or the museum, our destination is an old defunct airfield. The runway is disappearing under the onslaught of encroaching apartment blocks. When Piotr was a little boy, one could still see the concrete runway that divided the two housing estates named after Polish air squadrons. Many a kid learned how to ride a bike on the runway built by slave laborers. I'm telling you how to get there so you could see it for yourself before it disappears forever. Thank you. Thank you, Pio. Does anyone have a question for Pio before we move to the final panel? What is research for poems? Okay. Do you actually leave Poland, or do you just go and visit there now? Uh, just go and visit now. When were when were last there? Uh, two weeks ago. Oh. Yeah. When you were growing up there, how present was the Holocaust with you in your mind? Uh, it wasn't. It wasn't at all. Except uh, uh, I made a reference. Uh, one of the poems to having visited the Museum of Auschwitz many times. So it was present in the sense that um, uh, school children were required to go there on field trips. Um, um, I mean, that was, that was pretty much it. The, uh, the former Jewish quarter, Kazimierz, in Krakow, now has been beautifully restored. Uh, the synagogues have been uh, repaired, etc. But it's really a touristy kind of uh, hopping destination. Uh, uh, of course, there is the uh, um, um, uh, a food path. You know, you can you can go around and sightsee and whatnot. But it's but when I was a kid, that was a, that was an off limits kind of place. You never you never went there. Um, and you know, as many of you, of you know, the, the communist authorities they they made it their uh, their goal to to equate and equalize, right? Everybody's suffering. And so um, you know, we did hear about the Holocaust, but only the reference of you know, Polish people suffered as part of the Holocaust, etc. Um, um, but there's a lot being done in Poland to, uh, um, you know, to revise that um, that narrative that had existed for so long.
Thank you very much. Thank you. professor in the Department of French and Italian. She's also the director of the USC Francophone Research and Resource Center. She has authored three biographies and is working on a fourth, and has written several monographs and articles about literary networks. So please join me in welcoming Professor Moosley. Thank you very much, Martha, and I want to thank everybody from the foundation. Uh, I was there in July, and I mean, as you will see, this was actually very important. Not exactly for the reason I imagined it would, but um, it turned out to be a very important moment. I'm trying to get to the slideshow. Say from beginning. You see the, the first button. Yeah, Um, so uh, my project at the foundation was to um, look at um, testimonies from or about writers uh, writing on the fret. Um, that's kind of the title of my project. And um, the fret in question was occupation, war, uh, mostly occupation, my territory is France. And I was going to look at um, writers who were in France, not only writers of French language, but writers who were in France during the war. Um, so that included refugees from different countries, um, etc. I did write a biography of Max Jacob, and it came out in 2005. Um, so that was a while back. But he was definitely one of the writers I wanted to work on um, under this kind of um, framework um, for different reasons. And uh, one of them because um, Max Jacob is one of those poets and person who, he was born Jewish um, and uh, became a Christian. And um, in 1921, uh, actually retired to um, uh, an abbey in France, uh, in the center of France, uh, Savinois sur Loire, uh, where he stayed most of his life until 1944 when he was arrested. And um, he was there not only um, uh, at the church, but he was also working at the church. He, he was the, the staple of this abbey. Um, and uh, that's where he um, was arrested in 1944. So here are just two pictures. Um, one of them is actually from 1944, um, earlier in the year. Um, and um, I started by looking at testimonies around him, just because that was kind of easy uh, as a starting point, something I knew well. Uh, and there were several testimonies that actually talked about him. He, um, uh, one of them, I'm just going to go quickly through the three of them. Uh, Francoise Pepe, uh, she knew him through um, her grandfather, who um, actually was one of the persons who was protecting Mexico and giving him money. Um, and uh, during the war, at the beginning of the war, Max Jacob said, you know, I don't think I can write anymore. Um, another reason why I'm writing, looking at it. So he started painting a lot. He replaced writing with painting. And uh, what happened is that the people who couldn't buy his work anymore uh, bought his paintings or gave him old edition of his own work to illustrate, uh, which gives us a very interesting collection of those books that are on one, in many ways, totally unique. Uh, so her grandfather was one of those um, persons. 
The other aspect of Marc Jacob in Southern Western Wall is that he was a citizen of the town. Uh, and he was an ordinary citizen of the town. Uh, or at least that's how he wanted to be. Uh, that's who he wanted to be. And um, this testimony was amazing. Uh, Fernand was a young man, and he was hiding in a farm uh, near Saint Benoit, and he was doing farm work. And that's how he came to know Mac Jacob. And Mac Jacob didn't have any money, uh, really, no, not at all. Uh, found some to help him out and to get him out of the region and uh, into. Um, another hiding place. Um, February 20th, 1944 is the last picture, is the last day of which we have pictures of Max Jacob. Max Jacob, he was, you know, retired in this little tiny, it's a village, it, it's a big abbey, it's a very important abbey, but it's a really a village had um, a very important social life because he was friend with all those young poets who totally revered him. And uh, he um, welcomed them usually on Sundays after mass. Uh, and he had kind of a salon, um, a, a literary gathering. And this is one of the closest uh, poet, young poet at the time, Marcel Béalieu who was also uh, taking a lot of pictures of Mac Jacob. So a lot of the pictures that we have from 1943, 1944, were actually Marcel Bialu's picture. Here the, the picture was taken by Marcel Bialu's wife. Uh, so this is February 19th, 20th, uh, 1944. Um, and as you can see, this is the room where Mac Jacob lived. You can see the bed in the back. This is all his books on mental. And he lived in one room. Uh, he, Read the room um, from a woman there, um, and um, here um, starts the mystery. Um, February twentieth, nineteen forty-four. He takes Marcel Bialy, who knows very well the Abbey and the church. Uh, Marcel Bialy was born uh, about thirty kilometers from, from there. Uh, and they go for the Abbey and visit it as tourists. And for the first time since 1921, Max Jacob signs the um, visitor's book. Nobody knows why. I mean, this is, this is a place where he would go three times a day to pray, to the Mass. Um, he signs the book. And the book, he signs it, and he says, Max Jacob, 1921-1944. Okay. Uh, I just put this uh, because this in the, the church now there is uh, a marker where he used to go pray um, several times a day in the little chapel. So that was just my little illustration. <coughs> February 29th. Um, actually, there's. I you know, missed the slide. Um, February 29th, um, he is arrested in Southern West of Loire. Um, and it, it's actually not right, but it's February 24th he is arrested. And February 29th is the near rival I don't see. Sorry, I thought I had made a slide about that. He is arrested in Southern West of Loire after Mass. Um, by the Gestapo, and this is important, he's actually arrested by German uh, soldiers, not by French, because as you know, unfortunately the French police was very well known to uh, arrest, uh, to do the job for the Germans. Um, so he's actually arrested by uh, the Gestapo itself, which means that he was arrested by higher ups. Um, he was important enough to so they come from Orléans, which is about 20 kilometers away from there, and they arrest him and transport him to the prison in Orléans. Uh, he doesn't resist the arrestation. Right away, everybody knows about it, and there's like a whole machine of uh, friends and uh, people close to power trying to get him released. 
Um, in Orléans, he stays uh, three days, and then he is transported to Drancy, which is the camp in the suburb of Paris uh, where um, a lot of Jewish people were um, put before they were actually deported. Um, it's one of the camps. Um, there is another big one, Compiègne, not really far, for, a little further from Paris. And what is interesting also is that he's not transported to Pitivier. Pitivier is actually in the suburbs of Orléans, so it, it would be the closest one, and that's where also people were deported from Pitivier, but he's transported to Drancy. He arrives in Drancy, and right away he is sent to the infirmary. He is sent uh, with the eels. And that's, um, this is, this is what I had to work with when I wrote the biography. Testimonies like this, uh, and I'm sorry it's in French, but I will do a very quick translation. So uh, this is the doctor who was there when he was there. And, um, and the accounts that we have, the written accounts that we have, are all the same, presenting somebody who was uh, ready to die, um, who um, wanted to die as a Catholic, but didn't want to hurt people around him because you know he was surrounded by Jewish people. So he was like, you know, don't take, don't, don't take it bad, but I, I really want to die as a Catholic. Um, and that's the pour ne pas nous froisser. He really uh, didn't want people to to be offended. Um, and uh, everybody talks about the modesty, about the acceptance, about, you know. The only problem is that, as you can see on the picture of February 20th, uh, he's not sick. And we still don't know what that sickness was. Uh, and as everybody, I just accepted that theory of the guy who gets sick in the train and, uh, and by the way, it's a, Today it's less than an hour of a train ride. So even if you factor in the war and the stops and the, the whole thing, let's say that's three or four hours. Um, so, um, so I just accepted that. Uh, and then I discovered something at the foundation that just totally blew my mind and the mind of many um, specialists of my checkup because we're not, nobody had seen that um, before. So before I go into that testimony, um, actually, it's funny because Nisha, your um, acceptance of death uh, category really uh, is, is about that. Um, this is another part of the mystery. January 20th, 1944, uh, Magellan had a lot of people he was writing to. So we have tons of letters. And, um, at the end of January, he uh, writes to one of his friends, who was another young poet, and he says, well, you know, the problem with the life of the body and the spirit is that they are attached to each other. Um, and uh, illnesses have a moral origin. And um, even, and the moral, of course, is part of the physical. Um, so, so this is a very interesting thing. If you think that two months later, this guy will be dead. Um, so here's the testimony. And, um, and actually, for the sake of time, uh, you know, I, I, I will not show it. Um, and unfortunately, I don't have, because it's in French, I just realized that. Um, René David, she was arrested, she was arrested, she was never deported. Uh, she spent quite a long time in Drancy and then was um, in prison for political reasons. She was Jewish um, and um, didn't know much at all. And she met him at Drancy because she was helping in the, in the sick ward. And um, she says, it was strange. Uh, this person was dead within five days, but when he came in, he was not sick. He was standing, he was walking, he was fine. 
uh, nor was any question of sending him to the hospital. Because what happened is when people were really sick at the Halsey, they were actually sent to the Jewish hospital in Paris, uh, which was also a prison. Uh, but just because the French authorities who were sharing the authority over the Halsey didn't want any, any uh, illness to spread. So it was not out of mercy, but it was just out of fear. Um, so she's like, you know, there was no question of transporting him or anything. Um, and uh, so that uh, testimony really um, transformed the whole um, vision and also kind of, for me, pieced together the other uh, little pieces that I showed you. Uh, to say that um, I think that Mike Jacob didn't die of any illness. He just died of, okay, I don't have anything else to do. He had stopped writing um, because he couldn't be published anymore. And Jewish writers couldn't be published. Um, he had gone to the, to the end of the journey. Uh, and that's really um, something that really struck me, and um, I went back to a classic uh, that I had read a long time ago as one of the testimonies. I didn't pay that much attention. I read Frankel like I read Levy, like I read Rousset, like I read, you know, um, uh, all of those, thinking, looking for clues about life in the camps and uh, and Mike Jacob brought me back to Frankel um, because uh, Frankel is the one who says, basically, I survived because there was a meaning to my survival. I wanted to write the book that I couldn't publish right before the war. What happened with Frankel is that he was arrested and deported with a manuscript in his pocket, literally. The only thing he took in his pocket was his manuscript of this book that he had just finished, and the manuscript was lost. So he spent his time in camps thinking about this manuscript, taking even notes, um, finding ways of remembering things, uh, so he could right away, after uh, being liberated, he had no, it's not that he had no doubt that he would be liberated, but he, that, that was his goal, and he worked to that. And, um, he actually succeeded. He uh, survived the camps and went back and wrote that book and published that book in 1946 or 47. Mm -hmm. uh, so going back to um, man's search for meaning, and you know, Nisha would push you towards that uh, too, uh, I found those two quotes talking about you need a meaning to, to keep on living. Um, and that was, uh, that was really um, uh, something that uh, struck me about uh, Jacob. So I just wanted to show you an excerpt of you know, what I'm working on. This is really kind of a, a, a little slice of it. Uh, but it's also an important slice because Mike Jacob is a very well-known poet. He has had, um, there's a lot of scholarship. Uh, and uh, when I, you know, dug up this thing, I was like, well, why is anybody talking about it? Um, and I asked one of the main specialists of Jacob in France, and she didn't know about it. Um, and um, so I think that the next, the next story will be written very differently. Are there any questions for Professor Moosley? Can you uh, clarify the mystery about when you have the title of writing on the thread and you talk about uh, him as not writing, actually? Yeah, uh, the, the mystery was uh, <laughs> The, one of the reasons I had chosen Jacob as, um, as one of the authors that I wanted to study is that he was one of the very few authors who, during the war, uh, asked the question about keeping on writing. 
the main attitude in France has been, um, and I'm talking about France just because that's, that's what I know best, but the main attitude has been, oh, we're going to write to resist. Writing as an act of resistance was the thing. Uh, so you have the Aragon, you have the Iraq, you have all the, you know, all the big poets who did a wonderful, a wonderful job as resistant and as poets. Um, Mike Jacob was the first one uh, to question it. And he started to question it in 1940. He started to question it during the, exact, during the, the time um, uh, people were fleeing the invasion. Uh, the Germans were marching in in France and people were fleeing. And he actually lived, Seven Wise, is right by one of the main bridge over the Loire. And for those who don't know, the Loire is, is a big river. And the Loire was actually the, the articulation between the northern zone that was occupied and the south zone that was supposedly not occupied uh, during most of the war in France. Um, and uh, so he was seeing all those people uh, leaving and going for the bridge, and you know, uh, and he he wrote about it, deciding that he was not going to write anymore. And then uh, a few months later, after the the Germans were um, in power and Jewish writers didn't have the right to publish anymore, he was like, "See, I'm right. I just I can't even publish." Um, so that's that's why I took him as one of the writers of my, um, of my corpus. Okay, thank you, Professor. Thank you. So to conclude, I'd like to thank our fellows who presented their fascinating research. I'd like to thank all of you for coming. We have two um, exciting upcoming events that I want to tell you about. One is on April 20th. Our Center Research Fellow Alexander Korb is going to give a lecture about the participation of non-Germans in the Holocaust in Eastern Europe. And the other is on May 8th, Omer Bartok will be visiting us to give the Shapiro Scholar Lecture um, called his, his talk is titled Anatomy of a Genocide, the Life and Town, the Life and Death of a Town Called Bucha. Um, so we encourage you to attend and please sign up for our newsletter. The newsletter sign up sheet is right here so you can stay posted on all our events and fellowship opportunities like these. Thank you so much. Thank you.